The U.S. Navy timeline from World War II to the Korean War, 1945 to 1950, is a significant yet forgotten part of naval history. This will provide the framework and the backdrop for understanding the entire series on the U.S. Navy between World War II and the Korean War. This is U.S. Military History. In this episode, we will highlight the biggest factors happening in the United States and around the world affecting the U.S. Navy between 1945 and 1950. Before we start, we need to go over a few particulars about budgets and budget years. I know, everyone's favorite subject. Now, all stats pertaining to number of ships, amount of personnel, and size of budget are always listed by year. You would think that it referred to January of that year to December of that year. However, fiscal budget year for the federal government starts October 1st. This means the naval budget, which determines the number of warships and amount of personnel for that specific year, actually starts in the fourth quarter of the previous year. So, as we look at personnel and force structure limits, we need to note they are put in place when the budgets begin in October. Moreover, we will see how world events affect these numbers, specifically when budgets are being debated over and finalized in the spring and summer seasons. As we look at the major events of this timeline, we will also look at the force structure, the personnel level, and the budget of the Navy. With this, we'll be able to analyze the capabilities of the Navy during this time. Now, let's begin with the biggest influence on these five years, World War II. The U.S. joined World War II on December 7, 1941. The U.S. Navy participated in major events during the war. Some of them included the Battle of the Java Sea, the Battle of the Coral Sea, the Battle of Midway, Guadalcanal and Solomon Island campaigns, the Gilbert Islands, the Marshall Islands, Battle of the Philippine Sea, Iwo Jima, and Okinawa. It was at the height of the war in 1943 when the Navy began planning what it would look like after the war. Here, they planned the future force structure, budget, and mission of the Navy. This would provide the Navy with the blueprint for its organization and how it would conduct itself for the next several years. The second episode of this series goes deeper on the development and application of this post-war plan. On the eve of Pearl Harbor, the U.S. Navy had 225 warships. A massive shipbuilding program was in progress at the time, and it would dramatically increase the amount of warships during the war. In 1942, the Navy had 282 warships. In 1943, it grew to 754 and then 1,054 in 1944. Their annual budget was $4.4 billion on December 7th. It dramatically increased to $21 billion in 1942, then $31 billion in 43, and $21 billion in 44. In terms of personnel, there were 383,000 when the war started. In 1942, it grew to 1.2 million, then 2.3 million in 43, and 3.2 million in 44. Now comes 1945, the last year of the war. Several major changes occurred this year. In April of that year, President Franklin Roosevelt died, and Vice President Harry Truman, who just got in office 80 days before, became the 33rd President of the United States. On May 8th, victory comes in Europe while forces in the Pacific are finishing up on Okinawa and beginning to focus on the Japanese mainland. In July, Truman replaces the current Secretary of State, James Burns. Burns is going to be one of the biggest influences on U.S. foreign policy right after the war. The other most important leaders at this time were Secretary of the Navy, James Forstall, and Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Ernest King. That summer, the U.S. Navy was preparing for the invasion of Japan 
codenamed Operation Downfall. It would be the largest invasion in history, which in size and duration would significantly surpass D-Day in Europe. The Navy was stockpiling its forces and supplies in preparation of this massive invasion. On August 6th and August 9th, the world was shocked when the atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This resulted in the unconditional surrender of Japan six days later on August 15th, with the surrender ceremony taking place on September 2nd. That from this solemn occasion, a better world shall emerge out of the blood and carnage. Of on that day, September 2nd, the Navy had over 1,200 warships, 2,000 support ships, and 4,000 amphibious ships. It had around 40,000 aircraft, had an annual budget of 29 billion, and had around 4 million personnel. It was at its peak in power. You can get my detailed infographic of those warships in the link below in the video description and first comment in the comment section. Called Basic Post-War Plan Number 1, the Navy began decommissioning ships and personnel to the level specified in that plan. On VJ Day, 202 ships were under construction. Almost immediately, ships were canceled in mass numbers. In the end, only 58 of those 202 ships would be completed. You can get my detailed infographic of those warships under construction and what happened to them in a link below in the video description and first comment in the comment section. The Navy's demobilization plan called for a year of demobilization to properly lay up the fleet and release the majority of the 3.4 million sailors from service. However, the steady plan of releasing personnel home turned into a wild mess as America demanded their boys back home faster. At the same time, the Navy was laying up its unused ships in a mothball fleet that took over two years to properly and carefully put its vast armada of ships in a safe reserve status. The third episode of the series explores this demobilization process more. On September 11th, Operation Magic Carpet commences in which warships serve as makeshift transports in order to bring back the millions of Americans overseas from all branches of the military. This amazing feat is captured in detail in episode 4 of this series. In October of 1945, after several months of meetings, the United Nations was officially established with 50 governments initially involved. Also in October was the beginning of the 1946 fiscal budget year. Approved at $29.1 billion, that number would be slashed by Congress to $16.7 billion. Now that the war was over, President Truman wanted to slash the military budget as much as possible to bring America back into peacetime numbers. Although their budget was slashed to less than 60% of what it used to be, the Navy was able to save money by canceling projects and setting up a fund of wartime surplus that would save around $2 billion for use later. This money would be crucial for survival during these next five years. November 5th sees an FR-1 fireball make the first jet engine aircraft landing aboard a carrier. Although only a hybrid plane with both a piston engine and a jet engine, this is the first time a jet engine is used alone for carrier operations. December 1st, Admiral Chester Nimitz replaced Admiral Ernest King as CNO of the Navy. Four days later, on December 5th, the famous Flight 19 of five TBM Avengers disappeared over the Bermuda Triangle, never to be heard of again, spawning theories for generations about the mysteries of the Bermuda Triangle. 1946 the first full year of peace after World War II. Around the world, the civil war in China between the nationalists and the communists continues. The civil war in Greece continues. The USSR refuses to withdraw its forces from Iran. In March, Churchill gives his famous speech, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent and there is nothing for which they have less respect than for weakness, especially military weakness. On the home front, President Truman tries to restore the country after the war. He redirects as much finances from the military as possible and directs it at the economy. 
the U.S. Navy is focused on several things this year. Demobilization of its wartime personnel, decommissioning most of its ships and establishing the mothball fleet, Operation Magic Carpet and the transportation of men back home, patrol of Japanese waters, support of nationalist Chinese in the Chinese Civil War, Arctic operations, and Operation Crossroads and the beginning bomb trials. Along with drawing down the Navy to a peacetime fleet, the Navy was focused on unification of the military branches. Heading towards the formation of the Department of Defense, the Navy has conflict with the other services over unification. A meeting in Key West between the heads of the Army, Army Air Corps, and Navy gets nowhere as tensions between the branches increases. In June and July, Operation Crossroads is finally ready and it begins testing atomic weapons and their effects on ships. The tenth episode of this series will go deeper on this famous operation. On July 21st, the first landing of a pure jet on board an aircraft carrier was accomplished by the FH-1 Phantom. October sees the completion of the demobilization of naval personnel along with the ending of Operation Magic Carpet. The fourth episode of this series will highlight the demobilization process. Even though the demobilization of personnel has gone according to plan, the decommissioning of ships has fallen far behind. Due to the fast withdrawal of sailors, ships have been sitting at shore facilities by the thousands waiting for decommissioning with very few to provide the process. The Navy predicts it might take another two or more years to finish decommissioning ships and setting up the mothball fleet. October also sees the beginning of the Navy's fiscal year 1947 budget. This budget saw several reductions to it. With this, the budget was set to $4.4 billion. The Navy would spend around $922 million from its wartime surplus fund during the year to end 1947 total expenditures at $5.3 billion. A reduction in post-war plan 1A saw the formation of post-war plan 2. This saw a fleet consisting of 291 active warships, 42 reserve warships, and a mothball fleet of 632 warships. Of the active ships, there were four battleships, 12 fleet carriers, 10 escort carriers, 8 heavy cruisers, 21 light cruisers, 126 destroyers, 30 destroyer escorts, and 80 submarines. The Navy is budgeted for 500,000 personnel. However, since most of the 3.5 million sailors have been discharged, the Navy begins 1947 with a 40,000 shortfall in numbers. This means the Navy will have 40,000 untrained recruits plus another 50,000 without experience, forming a significant portion of those aboard naval warships. Admiral Nimitz mentions in a meeting with Congress that many ships will have had up to half of its sailors untrained and inexperienced. A stark difference to a year earlier where the men in the U.S. Navy were the most experienced sailors in history. 1947. 1947 saw a change occur in U.S. foreign relations. The Greek Civil War continued as Britain found itself under financial stress and was forced to pull away its support against the communists in Greece. Truman picked up the slack and requested funds to back the Greek government in the conflict. Truman gave aid to Greece and Turkey, which led to the American foreign policy of Soviet containment, dubbed the Truman Doctrine. In January, Operation High Jump is in full swing as the U.S. Navy continues to test its Arctic capabilities while supporting the American research station in Antarctica. Also in January, President Truman replaces James Burns with George C. Marshall as Secretary of State. Marshall's now in charge of America's foreign policy. On February 12th, the USS Cusp becomes the first submarine to launch a guided missile. Though several African Americans received commissions as reserve officers in World War II, on March 15th, John W. Lee becomes the first black officer to receive a commission in the regular Navy. The Navy's main focus during the first part of this year was the outcome of U.S. military unification. The Army and the about-to-be-independent Air Force were challenging the Navy by trying to take away naval aviation and the Marines, calling both redundant to the Army and Air Force capabilities. Eventually, the National Security Act of 1947 was established. On July 26, this act became law and the National Military Establishment was created 
and the U.S. Air Force became a separate branch of the military. The Secretary of the Navy, James Forstall, becomes the first Secretary of Defense. He is replaced by John Sullivan, who becomes the 49th Secretary of the Navy. The ninth episode of the series goes deeper in this unification process, specifically the bitter fighting between the branches. The first launch of a guided rocket from a U.S. Navy ship takes place on the deck of the USS Midway in Operation Sandy. October sees the beginning of the Navy's fiscal year 1948 budget. President Truman's focus at the time was to balance the federal budget, and in his mind, the military was the most effective place to trim that budget. This saw the naval budget begin to dwindle. The budget was set to $3.6 billion, $832 million less than the previous year. The Navy offsets that with $447 million from its naval fund. This, unfortunately, reduces the force structure of the Navy by 18 less warships. Three battleships are decommissioned, leaving only one battleship, the USS Missouri. Carriers are reduced by three, to a total of only nine active carriers. The force is also reduced by four destroyers and ten destroyer escorts. It, however, is increased by two light cruisers, which will go into commission this year. Auxiliaries and amphibious ships are reduced by almost 400 ships, reducing their number to 538. This mostly comes from the reduction of amphibious carrying capacity of two reinforced marine divisions down to four marine regimental combat teams. Along with this is the reduction of dozens of aircraft squadrons. The highest the Navy ever got in personnel in 1947 was 446,000, over 50,000 less than budgeted. The 1948 budget would only provide for 450,000 personnel, a significant drop from the previous year. The major problem was that around 210,000 of enlistments would be up by mid-1948, cutting the Navy personnel strength in half. Universal military training was being considered by the governments right after World War II, which would have required all eligible males to receive one year of military training. This would have provided the services with ample personnel to fill their billets. If this was not going to be passed in the upcoming year, the Navy was going to lose half its personnel mid-year. Something significant was going to need to be decided upon by Congress. December 15th sees Admiral Chester Nimitz replaced by Admiral Louis Stenfield as the 11th Chief of Naval Operations. 1947 comes to an end seeing the establishment of the post-war fleet along with the official unification of the military services under one Secretary of Defense. 1948 1948 took a turn in geopolitics as tension grew in Europe. In February, a coup occurred in Czechoslovakia and it fell to communism. The last of the Eastern European countries was now under the Soviet bloc of influence. On March 11th, due to the bitter fighting between the services, a meeting between the heads of military branches met in Key West to work out the roles and missions of each branch. Here. The Navy gives the Air Force primacy in strategic bombing, while the Air Force agrees to put aside its opposition to the construction of a supercarrier. Along with defining other roles, the Key West Agreement was signed by President Truman and approved in July. April 1st sees the commissioning of the Navy's first helicopter squadron, Helicopter Squadron 1, Fleet Angels. After several months of stalling, the Marshall Plan received immediate approval after the Czechoslovakian coup and on April 3rd, $5 billion was approved to support the economies of Europe in hopes of curtailing the domino effect of communism. On May 5th, operating the FH-1 Phantom, the Navy's first jet squadron became operational, Fighter Squadron 171 Aces. On June 1st, Navy and U.S. Air Force Strategic Airlift Squadrons came together to form the Military Air Transport Service, or MATS for short. This is the precursor for the Air Mobility Command today. Seeing that universal military training would cost upwards of $2 billion a year, Congress officially voted it down. Needing to fill the upcoming shortage of personnel in the Navy and other branches, the Selective Service Act of 1948 was enacted on June 24 to establish the draft. This would provide the Navy with the needed personnel to fill the mass amount of personnel about to leave the service. Congress would pass another act. Captain Joe Bright Hancock, a Navy veteran of both World Wars, was Director of Waves, women accepted for voluntary emergency service. For the past several years, she was lobbying for women to be admitted into the regular Navy. 
Congress would pass the Women's Armed Forces Integration Act of June 1948. Hancock's successful efforts in integrating women into the Navy laid the foundation for the modern era, in which women wear the stars of admirals and fly combat missions. On that same day, the Soviet Union blockaded West Berlin, preventing all food and coal from coming in. West Berlin had 36 days worth of food and 45 days worth of coal. America decided instead of giving West Berlin to the Soviets, they would supply it through an airlift. Starting small, but eventually growing in size, the airlift over time would be able to fully supply West Berlin. The Berlin airlifts would continue for almost a year. Being an election year, President Truman was forced to step aside from troubles in Europe and focus on campaigning. Public opinion was turning against him. With only a 36 approval rating, it was predicted that he would lose the race. He was also failing to raise funds for his campaign until a man came and helped his fundraising efforts. This man's name was Lewis Johnson. On July 26, President Truman signs the famous Executive Order 9981, ending racial discrimination in the armed services, which established a new era of desegregated military units. In the fall, a turn in the Chinese Civil War would see the Communists gain the upper hand against Nationalist China. Also in the fall, the Navy finally sees the completion of laying up World War II ships into the mothball fleet. This comes almost two years after it was intended to finish. In October, three Navy transport squadrons of C-54s were called up to participate in the Berlin airlift. VR-3 would support operations with transatlantic flights. VR-6 and VR-8 would join the Air Force in flying direct missions into Berlin. VR-8 would go on to be one of the highest performing transport squadrons during the Berlin airlift. October also sees the start of the Navy's fiscal year 1949 budget. Due to tensions in Europe with the Berlin airlift, the military sees a small growth in their budget. However, Truman limits the use of this money and tries to keep it as low as possible. The budget would be set for $3.7 billion and be offset by the last of the naval fund, which is $25 million. The fleet lost several key vessels. It dropped its carrier strength by one to a total of eight active carriers, a loss of two light carriers, 13 light cruisers, and numerous auxiliary ships. Also cut were a number of land-based patrol squadrons. The budget would aim for 500,000 personnel, but the Navy would only be able to maintain 450,000 through the 1949 budget year. Key that year was that it would be the last year the Navy could draw from its surplus war stocks, specifically stored aircraft. If the Navy budget for the 1950 fiscal year did not greatly increase to procure new equipment and aircraft, the Navy would see itself be reduced by a third of its size by 1950. Key in this year's budget was the cancellation of 12 ships under construction and a number of ships receiving upgrades. With this money, the Navy would save $200 million, which would be used for the Navy to begin construction on their future, a supercarrier called the USS United States. October 21st sees Jesse Brown become the first black naval aviator. Watch our series on the history of Jesse Brown and Tom Hudner as it compares to the movie Devotion. On November 2nd, to the shock of many, President Truman was re-elected president. So shocked was America that several mainline newspapers already printed the following morning's paper with Truman's defeat. 1949. In 1949, the Berlin airlift was in full force as tension increased around the world that brought about military buildup in the US. It will be seen, however, the greatest conflict for the Navy this year was not the global tensions, but conflict within America against the other military branches. January 7th, George Marshall resigns as Secretary of State due to ill health. Several days later, Dean Ackeson would be sworn in as the 51st Secretary of State. Ackeson would direct America in dealing with Soviet aggression and lead U.S. foreign policy into the Korean War. On March 28th, Secretary of Defense James Forrestal, from overexhaustion, stress from his position, and eventual demise in his mental health, was forced to resign his position. To replace him as the new Secretary of Defense, Truman would appoint Lewis Johnson, who helped him in his re-election. Truman was constantly frustrated with Forrestal for his failure to unite the military branches, not cutting the military's budget enough. In appointing Johnson, Truman gave him two objectives, drastically cut the defense budget and unify the services. 
Although not an easy job, Johnson would focus all his energy on these two tasks. More of an Air Force guy, Johnson would put his crosshairs on the U.S. Navy. On April 4th, after several months of negotiation, NATO was formed with 12 founding members and tasked with a mutual defense of Europe. The U.S. Navy would spend much of its year organizing itself within NATO structure. April 23rd, just five days after the construction began on the USS United States, Secretary of Defense Johnson outright canceled it. With support of the Air Force and Army, Johnson argued that the Navy's supercarrier was redundant to the Air Force's bomber force and was a waste of the federal budget. Refusing to give back the money reserved for the construction of the carrier, Johnson declared after only a month of being on the job, he had already saved the taxpayer $200 million. The future of naval aviation was in jeopardy. This would set in motion a series of events that would culminate in the following months. On April 29th, just six days after the cancellation of the Navy's supercarrier, Secretary of the Navy John Sullivan resigned in protest. After 323 days of airlift, the Soviet blockade of West Berlin was lifted and the airlift ended on May 12th. Tensions are high in Europe, but the West sees victory with Berlin airlift. On May 25th, Francis Matthews was appointed as the 50th Secretary of the Navy. Matthews was another important figure raising money for Truman during his re-election. With limited understanding of national defense issues and a near non-existent understanding or familiarity with either the U.S. Navy or the U.S. Marine Corps, Matthews admitted to never having set foot on board a floating vessel larger than a rowboat. This earned him the name Rowboat Matthews among naval personnel. On July 9th, Navy and Army transport and supply ships come together to form the Military Sea Transport Service. This is the precursor of the Sea Mobility Command today. With the cancellation of the United States, the tension between the Air Force and the Navy come to a head in what was dubbed the Revolt of the Admirals. Congressional hearings occurred in August and October after a document was leaked to Congress calling into question the Air Force B-36 program. Episode 11 of the Navy Interwar series walks through this in depth. On August 10th, Truman signed an amendment to the National Security Act of 1947 which renames the National Military Establishment the Department of Defense and gives more power to the Secretary of Defense by absorbing the three cabinet-level military departments. On August 29th, to the shock of the world, the USSR tests their first atomic bomb, eight years before expected. This eliminates America's monopoly of atomic warfare. In September, after three years of fighting, the Greek Civil War finally comes to an end. From September 20th through November 25th, the biggest amphibious operation between World War II and the Korean War occurred on the beaches of Hawaii, Operation Miki. This Navy Army operation consisted of the entire 2nd Infantry Division coming ashore from 40 major amphibious ships and escorted by two carrier divisions. This would be the largest amphibious operation after World War II until the landings of Incheon during the Korean War. Three days later, on October 1st, the Chinese Civil War ended with the Communists forming the People's Republic of China and the Nationalists retreating to the island of Taiwan. On October 27th, after being promised he would receive no penalty for testifying before Congress, Admiral Louis Denfeld was relieved of command of CNO of the Navy for his part in the revolt of the Admiral hearings. He was replaced on November 2nd by Admiral Forrest Sherman. Let's begin with the 1950 fiscal year budget. The budget would shrink to its lowest level at $3.5 billion. This would reduce the Navy by 74 ships. Of most importance, it would lose one entire carrier group. This meant it would lose one fleet carrier, two light carriers, two heavy cruisers, four light cruisers, 14 destroyers, five destroyer escorts, seven submarines, and 39 amphibious and auxiliary ships. The Navy would budget for around 420,000 personnel, but unfortunately would fall far short in filling that. On the day North Korea invaded South Korea, the Navy would only have 381,538 personnel, a far cry from what was needed to fill even a demobilized Navy. 1950. 
To the embarrassment of the Navy, its only battleship, the USS Missouri, ran aground at Hampton Roads, Virginia on January 17th. It is so stuck that it takes 23 vessels over two weeks to free it. On February 12th, while working on the 1951 fiscal year budget, President Truman ordered Secretary of Defense Johnson to reduce the total U.S. military budget from $14.5 billion in 1950 to $13 billion for 1951's budget. Johnson scoffed and said not only could he meet that, but he could effectively lower it to $12.6 billion. His plan was to take the most from the U.S. Navy, who was planning on reducing the carrier force to just five carriers, along with the reduction of some 50 more ships. In his mind, naval aviation was just a far less capable duplication of the Air Force bomber force. February 25th through March 11th saw Operation Portrex take place. It was a joint amphibious exercise off the coast of Puerto Rico that simulated a landing invasion using all branches of the military. Although smaller than Operation Miki just the previous year, Operation Portrex consisted of more coordinated joint maneuvers with Naval Surface and Aviation Units, the 3rd Infantry Division and 82nd Airborne Division, tactical and airdrop units from the Air Force, and some 17,000 Marines. Many lessons learned from this operation were to be applied in actual combat during the landings at Incheon six months later. On April 7th, the National Security Council Paper 68, or better known as NSC 68, was published. Starting with the Communists winning the Chinese Civil War and the USSR detonating an atomic bomb, NSC 68 began its formation. It would be the guiding document of the U.S. military in the Cold War. It designated the Soviets as the main threat to democracy and sought to counter it with a massive build-up program for the military. This would be the exact opposite approach that Truman was currently pursuing at the time. The Defense Department would spend most of the summer of 1950 proposing to the President the exact cost of this new approach to foreign policy. On April 8th, tensions greatly rise between the U.S. and the USSR as the Soviets shoot down a naval patrol craft over the Baltic Sea. All 10 crew members are never seen again and presumed killed in action. On the 21st of April, the first carrier takeoff of an AJ-1 Savage heavy attack bomber was made from the Coral Sea. This is the Navy's first use of an atomic bomber on a carrier. On June 24th, Secretary of Defense Johnson returns from a tour of allied nations in the Pacific. After visiting Japan, he tells the President there is no foreseeable threat from North Korea into South Korea. The next day, on June 25th, North Korea invaded South Korea and the Korean War begins. It is not until two days later that the U.S. gets involved. 